We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him, we seek His help, we ask His forgiveness. We bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and with no partner. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his final messenger. Um, the first thing that I just wanted to show you carrying on from yesterday is uh, a copy of the actual book itself. And these are a couple of, um, of copies. This one is entitled Awsaf and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it, this is the book Ash-Shama'il by At-Tirmidhi. It's the same book, but it just has a different title according to what they found. Babu ma jaa fi khalqi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first chapter, that which is narrated about the physical characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's just to show you what the book sort of looks like and just to show you, you know, so that you sort of have an idea. We're going to go back to the presentation in a second, but just for you guys to see a copy, an electronic copy of the book, inshallah, we should be able to put that on some sort of website or email link or something so that you guys can download it, even if it's just for you to flick through the book and actually look at it and say, this is the book that I've been studying. And there are, there's another one, uh, which is a similar copy. And again, it has the same thing. And it starts with Babu Maja'a Fi Khalqi Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to be switching back and forward between many different copies and, and looking at many different ahadith uh, today. Bi'idnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. And we will start, insha'Allah, by talking a little bit about reminding ourselves about how a Tirmidhi ordered his book. So who can remind me <coughs> about the, something about, without looking at your notes, something about the order that Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah chose in his book. He began with the physical characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did he start with after that? He, what he used to wear before he used to wear? His possessions. The things he used to have, his sword and his, uh, you know, his turban and, you know, his, uh, you know, like the things that he used to own. And then his clothing. And then he went into, <coughs> what was the next thing he mentioned? Characteristics. Went into his manners, <coughs> into his manners, and into how he used to deal with people, and then into his worship. And what did a Tirmidhi finish his book with? Dream. dream. Seeing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a dream. There are a lot of ahadith that we're going to cover today, bi idnillahi tabaraka wa taala. But we're going to start with the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, radiyallahu an. And Imam Al-Tirmidhi says, Babu ma jaa fi khalqi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the chapter that relates to the physical characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What are we expecting to see in here? Give me some examples. What kind of physical characteristics? Physique, height, weight, weight his sort of, you know, body composition, was he heavy set, what, you know, his posture, his facial complexion, the color of his skin. His eyes, his mouth, the, his hair, the length of it, and so on and so forth. These are the things that we're expecting to see in here. You might expect that Imam Al-Tirmidhi in this chapter would talk about the khatam, the seal of the Prophet, but he doesn't. He delays that until the fourth chapter of his book. So the first three relate to, or the first three in, in, in a broad sense, uh, parts relate to the physical characteristics, but Imam Al-Tirmidhi's second main chapter is on the Khatam, the seal that was on the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to join them all together before 11 o'clock, so we have a lot of stuff to go <coughs> through. The first hadith, Abu Raja Qutayba ibn Sa'id narrates from Malik ibn Anas. What's the difference between Malik ibn Anas and Anas ibn Malik? Father and son. They weren't father and son. But good guess though, Malik ibn Anas and Anas ibn Malik. Who is Malik ibn Anas and who is Anas ibn Malik? Easy first of all, who's Anas ibn Malik? The Sahabi, Al-Jalil, the servant of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Anas ibn Malik al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu wa arda. Who is Malik ibn Anas? Al-Imam Malik. Al-Imam Malik ibn Anas 
uh, the Imam and people often get them confused because their names are the reversal of each other but they were not there was not a, a, a close distance between them from Malik ibn Anas from Rabi'a ibn or uh, Abi Abdul Rahman that he heard uh, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an say the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was neither very tall such that he would be clearly noticed nor was he very short or nor was he short he was not extremely white and neither was he very brown. His hair was neither very curly nor was it completely straight. Allah commissioned him towards the end of his 40th year. He remained in Makkah for 10 years and in Medina for 10 years. Allah caused him to pass away at the turn of his 60th year and there were not to be found as much as 20 white hairs on his head and his beard. We have a lot to cover in this hadith, so we're going to break it down bit by bit. Anas radiallahu an, was sent by his mother, was brought by his mother at a very young age to serve the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Anas is describing what he knows of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and every one of the companions describes a different aspect. Every one of the companions sees something different. We're going to come across the hadith of Hind uh, perhaps in a little while and this is the hadith of Hind who is narrating to Al-Hasan ibn Ali radiallahu anhum so in this hadith the point I was going to make the hadith of Hind and this is the hadith in which Al-Hasan who only saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he was very small he asks his uncle Hind does anyone know who Hind was? Does anyone know who Hind's, who was Hind's mother? Now have a think of this, yeah? Hassan ibn Ali, who is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the grandson of the Prophet His mother is Ali and, sorry, his father is Ali, his mother is Fatima, radiallahu anha. He says, my uncle, my, my maternal uncle, my uncle on my mother's side. Now Fatima didn't have a brother, so how did he have an uncle on his, on his mother's side? Fatima didn't have a brother or did she? I'll leave you guys to think about that. Fatima didn't have a brother, we know the two sons of the Prophet Sallallahu died, Qasim and uh, Ibrahim passed away radiallahu anhum wa ardahum when they were very very small. So your question, just to get your mind thinking, who was Fatima's brother who narrates this hadith? Hind. In any case, Hind uh, narrates this and, and uh, Hassan Al Hassan says about him, وَكَانَ وَصَّافًا He was an expert in describing. Now Anas here is, gives a good description. But Hind, he was a wasaf, he was an expert, his expertise, and this, this was an expertise amongst the Arabs at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu a wasaf. Someone who is an expert at describing people. You know you have those guys who do the police, um, what do you call them, the, the, the photo fit descriptions. And they're an expert, you know they just talk to you and say what was his nose like, what was his mouth like, and they can literally draw you a picture. There were people like that in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but they didn't draw the pictures, but they, they described them in such a way that you would know the person. But Anas here is describing to the best of his ability. He says, مَا كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ or he said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَيْسَ بِالطَّوِيلِ الْبَائِنِ وَلَا بِالْقَصِيرِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was not طويل, which means tall, al-ba'in. And ba'in is when you notice somebody to be exceptionally tall. It doesn't mean that he wasn't tall, <coughs> but it means that you wouldn't notice him to be exceptionally tall. In another narration, and I haven't written this down so you can make a little note, it says, وَكَانَ إِلَى الطُولِ أَقْرَبِ He was closer to being tall than short. He was closer to being tall than he was to being short. That's in another narration of the hadith. وَكَانَ إِلَى الطُولِ أَقْرَبِ He was closer to being tall than he was to being short. And that's the same meaning here. He was not extremely tall or noticeably tall. So, you know when one of you stands up in the room, and he's six foot four. 
And I'm not talking about feet in the height of the Messenger of Allah. So nothing is narrated in terms of feet. But I'm just giving you an example you can understand. Someone six foot four. You notice him tower above everybody. <coughs> Someone is a brother is five foot four. You notice him being smaller than most of the people in the room. The Prophet وسلم, was not extremely tall. And notice he didn't say extremely short. He said he was not short at all. So anything that we would consider short for a man, maybe we'd even say, you know, like in our terms, we'd say 5'7", maybe even 5'8", is short for a man. So we're saying that he was not in any way short, nor was he so tall that you noticed him tower up above the people. And he was closer to being tall than he was to being short. So if you said in our terms today, if I was to give you an example of a man who is six foot tall, example, or five foot eleven, for example, or six foot one. You know, someone who is tall, but they don't tower above everybody. This is the example of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Allah subhanahu wa taala chose the best of characteristics. You know, when someone for a man is excessively tall, it's you know that's how Allah created them. But the, no doubt that the most beautiful in terms of the characteristics of a man is a man who is tall without being extremely tall. And that is how the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. He was tall, but he wasn't so tall that you would notice him tower above. In another narration, and again you can make a little note of this, it said, when he was amongst his companions, when he was with his companions, nobody would seem to be taller than him. When he was with his companions, nobody would seem to be taller than him. And that is one of the, the miracles in his physical characteristics. Even though there might be a person from the companions who is six foot six, example, yeah? That whenever the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would stand next to somebody, you would never see anybody tower above him. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala never gave anyone the look that they are overpowering the Messenger of Allah, that they're towering above him. He would seem to be the tallest of his companions, and yet when he was on his own, he would not seem to be exceptionally tall. So he was neither extremely <laughs> tall, nor was he short at all. He was of medium height, closer to being tall. And this is going to come in other hadith. He was a rab'atan or marbu'an. And rab'a and marbu'a in Arabic both mean someone who is of medium height, but like Anna said, or like the other narration, وَكَانَ إِلَى الطُّولِ أَقْرَبِ He was closer to being tall. So he had height in him, but you wouldn't look at him and say, oh, he's really, really tall. The hadith continues uh, after the tall and the short. وَلَا بِالْأَبْيَضِ الْأَمْهَقِ وَلَا بِالْآدَمِ Now Anas goes on to talk about his skin color. He said he was not al abyad al amhaq and abyad al amhaq is pure white like the color of you know uh, someone who is you know uh, purely white in the sense that their skin is absolutely white they have no color in their skin and they're sort of like limestone you know someone you see some of the english brothers who are very very fair and their skin is extremely white and that you to the point where it's abyad amhaq it's like absolutely white nor was he Adam, and the word Adam here means brown, brown colored skin. So the skin of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was often described as being white. It was also described as having a reddish tone or a brownish tone. And what is meant when we join all of these narrations together is that his skin was fair in terms of the Arabs, but it was not so fair as that you would describe him as being purely white. Nor was it so dark that you would describe his skin as being brown. So you would neither describe it as being excessively white nor brown, but somewhere in between. You know when you look at the kind of Mediterranean, the fair sort of Mediterranean color, that's neither white nor is it brown, but it's somewhere in between. And more than that, in other narrations it's mentioned, Bayadun mashroobun bi humrah. A white color that had a reddish tone to it. What's that, bayadun? Mashroobun bi humrah. But you can just write it in English. That a, that a white color that, was, that had a reddish color in it. So his skin didn't have a brownish tone in it. 
in the terms of the the color of his skin it didn't have like it didn't look like like a, a half cast kind of mix between white and brown it had more red in it than it had brown in it so it was white with a a reddish tone so he was not extremely white neither was he brown his hair was neither very curly nor was it completely straight so again just seeing this middle thing he's not so tall that he you know sort of is gangling above the people like so high and and neither is he short he is not brown in skin color nor is he white but he is in between and if you just look at that in skin color generally people who have a darker skin color what do they generally like in terms of what do they generally consider to be beautiful a lighter skin tone people who have a lighter skin color what do they generally consider to be beautiful a slightly darker skin tone yeah, so the two come together in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, when people are very white, they, re they appreciate a, a bit of a tan, yeah, like a, a bit of color in their skin. And when people are very dark, they appreciate fairness in the skin. So he was neither excessively white, nor was he brown, but he was a white that was mixed with red or a white with a tinge of brown in it. His hair was neither very curly, nor was it straight. al -ja'd Al Qatat is the word in Arabic. Al Jad Al Qatat, and Al Jad Al Qatat is the hair that is so curly that it it tangles into each other and bits of it hang over the others. Afro. <coughs> no, not Afro, but a, a hair that is it has. If you, even when you look amongst Middle Eastern hair, oh, yeah. but it's so curly that the curls sort of wrap itself around. And a Sabit is someone who has hair that looks like it's been straightened, you know, by a a sabt or a sabit is hair that's so straight when it hangs down, it looks almost like it's been straightened. It's absolutely straight. It's mentioned that his hair had a small wave in it. So it was slightly curly. It was slightly curly or it was slightly wavy. It had a small wave in it, but it was neither excessively curly that you would describe him as having curly hair, nor was it rigidly straight. And again, this is praiseworthy in terms of the Arabs and in terms of what people consider to be beautiful and handsome is that his hair had a wave in it, it had a little movement in it but it was not you know excessively straight you know so that it looked like it had been straightened nor was it excessively curly so bits of it would tangle and so they mentioned that his hair would not inter inter like intertwine with itself so it would not be sort of like tangly and messy but at the same time it would not be immaculately straight Allah commissioned him towards the end of his 40th year. We have no problem with this. The problem comes, he remained in Makkah for 10 years and in Medina for 10 years. Who can tell me the problem with that? Jayit. The problem here is that there were 13 years in, where? In Medina or in Makkah? Medina. 13 years in Medina? We sure? Yeah. Makkah. Or in Makkah? I will make a note, inshallah, you guys can have a little, little Google of it. 13 years in Makkah. 13 years in Makkah and 10 years in, in Medina. <coughs> Allah caused him to pass away at the turn of his 60th year. Again, what should it be at the turn of his 63rd year? And there were not to be found as much as 20 white hairs on his head and beard. There were not to be found as much as 20 white hairs. And what is mentioned is that the hairs, some of them said 14. And some of them said the tips of 14 of the hairs had, had got a little bit of, or the tips of his beard had a little reddishness in them. And you know the tips of the beard that have a little reddishness in them, that's when they're starting to go white but they haven't gone white. So it's mentioned that some of the hairs in his beard had, the tips of them had started to, 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 to turn lighter. So to have a reddish sort of tone to them. And that's what happens before it turns white. But they, they were owned, there were less than 20 and some said 14 white hairs on the head and the beard of the Prophet together, if you counted them together. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the most complete example of beauty and, and of handsomeness that a man can have. As for this issue in the narration, the narration is sahih and there's no issue with this narration at all. What this is is an example, there are a number of ulama mentioned this, they said this is an example of what they call ilgha al kasr which is where the narrator is talking in a general sense. And so I've actually deliberately mistranslated it as 10 years, but what might be said is around 10 years. 
That's what Anas was not talking specifically. He's saying about 10 years in Makkah and about 10 years in Medina and he died at about 60. He's not, he's not giving uh, a, a like, uh, you know, 10 years to the day on the dot that he, he's just saying, you know, 10 years, 10 years, 60. Like he's giving a general, a general overview. So he's taking away, like much when someone says, uh, you know, 6.3 and they round it down to 6. So it's that kind of example here. That's what we think, or that's what most of the ulama mentioned, because there's nothing wrong with this hadith from a chain, there's nothing wrong with this hadith from a point of view, but even if Anas himself uh, sort of uh, didn't know the exact length of time in Makkah, remember that Anas didn't live in Makkah with the Prophet He only met the Prophet in Medina. So the fact that, you know, that Anas narrates this, it's not an issue for us, because what we, what we want is the description within it. Moving on, to the second hadith, Humayd ibn Mas'adah al-Basri narrated to us that Abdul Wahhab al-Thaqafi narrated from Humayd, from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, that he said, and this is another hadith of Anas on the same topic, another wording of the hadith of Anas. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was of medium stature, and that's what we, we meant by his neither, very tall nor short, <coughs> of a goodly build. And his build his physique was a good physique, and it's mentioned about his physique as well, and we're going to come, of some of the, come across some of the things that were mentioned about his physique. But before we talk about them, generally it's mentioned again in his physique, he was neither what you would describe as heavy set, or fat, you know, like, or, or very, not even fat, but heavy set, you know, he wasn't like a big, heavy sort of person, nor was he thin. So he, well, he was of a good build, a physically strong and healthy build. He had the signs of strength. They mentioned that he, you know, the ends of his, you know, where his joints and his bones were bulky. You know, like, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a great amount of strength. It's mentioned that his hands were thick set. He had thick hands and feet. But in having that, those characteristics, he was not what you would call heavy set, a big heavy sort of person. Nor was he what you would call thin. And again, this is the perfect description of a man. He's athletic, he's, he he's fit, he's physically strong, but he's not so physically strong that he's what you'd call bulky and cumbersome and sort of like, they say he didn't lift his feet when he used to walk, he didn't lift his feet like it was a hardship for him, like, you know, sort of a big sort of boom, lifting his feet one by one. He didn't lift his feet like that. He was lean, but not what you would call lean or thin. He was, he was strong without being thin, and he was strong without being bulky. So this is kind of his, his uh, bit of his build. His, high, his hair was neither curly nor completely straight. He had a brownish complexion. Some of the ulama reject this hadith with the word brown in it. And they say this is a mistake from one of the narrators. Because this uh, brownish complexion rejects or goes against what is mentioned in the other hadith. That white mixed with red or white with a reddish tint. What we can say is one of two things. Either one of the narrators made a mistake in the word brownish or what is also possible is that he's indicating a, a sort of a brownish color that comes from white mixed with red. When you have white skin that is naturally sort of, you know, uh, tan and it has that reddish tone in it, it can appear to be to have a, a kind of a light, a very, very light brown kind of color. So either we say it's like that or either we say that the Rawi, the narrator in the hadith, made a mistake and it, we go back to all of the other hadith that are authentic that say white mixed with red or a light colour, neither white nor brown. Um, but if you say a brownish complexion, it doesn't, I don't think it contradicts it so openly that you can just you know, throw the hadith away. Because it's safe to say that if someone has a light coloured sort of skin from the Arabs, a very light skin, and it has a very reddish complexion, it has a degree of, of, a, of a brownish tone to it as well. <coughs> and when he walked, he would lean forward. And it's mentioned in another narration, as though he was walking down an incline. He would walk so briskly and so quickly, his companions would have to run to catch up. And it's mentioned when he would lift his feet, he would not lift his feet in a heavy sort of way. He would lift his feet with power and strength. He would walk very strongly, had a very strong stride. 
it's also mentioned that his stride would not be excessively wide. So he would not, he had a naturally long stride. That's also mentioned, he had a naturally long stride. But it was not so long that he unnaturally was making big, big, big steps. Like someone who's trying to jump three or four stairs at a time. And he's naturally stretching his legs. But by his natural physique, he would have a large, a long stride. And he would walk with power. One of the words used in Arabic is that he would walk with power, such that he would lift his feet with strength and power, as though you could see the strength that was in him. And when he would walk, he would, he would be walking so briskly that it would be as if he was decline, going down an incline. As though he was going down an, a hill. You know, he's leaning forward and he's walking very, very, very quickly. And it's mentioned in other narrations that the companions would rush they would not be able to catch up with his natural walking pace. He would walk very, very quickly. Continuing on, because we have so many ahadith to cover. Muhammad ibn Bashar al-Abdi narrated to us that Muhammad ibn Ja'far narrated from Shu'bah, from Abu Ishaq, that he heard Al-Bara radiallahu an say, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had slightly curly hair and was of medium stature with broad shoulders. His hair was thick, reaching his earlobes, and he wore a red hullah. I have never seen anything more beautiful than he. This is one of the ahadith that describe the beauty of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise, in the hadith of Al-Hasan ibn Ali <coughs> radiallahu an, lam ara qablahu wa la ba'dahu mithlah. I have never seen anyone before or after him that looked like him. And in another hadith, I compared him to the moon and I found him to be more beautiful than the moon. And for the Arabs, the moon is the absolute, you know, pinnacle of beauty. You know, like when they used to describe beauty in Arabic poetry, they often use the moon. And he said, I saw the moon on a full night. This hadith is daif, but it has some uh, supporting narrations. That I saw the moon on, on its full night, when the light was out and the moonlight was, you know, splashing all over the land. And I saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wearing a red hullah, which we'll come to in a moment. And he, then he says about it, he said, and I looked at him and I looked at the moon and I found him to be more beautiful than the moon. Now imagine the moon on a full night and it, the moonlight is everywhere. It's a beautiful sight to see the clear sky and the moonlight is shining on the trees. And then he looks at the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said he was more beautiful than the moon. So, um, who, who was it that, that said that? The Sahabi. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. We can find it. We can do a quick search at the end. It's one of the hadith in Imam in, in a Tirmidhi's book, but I don't think we mentioned it. Jabir. Jabir. Yeah. Now, I don't, there are two narrations. One is from Jabir and one is from another Sahabi. One of them is Daif and one of them is okay, but possibly from the hadith of Jabir. Jabir. Hadith of Jabir. We've got one in the, in the book. Jayid. Yeah. From Jabir? Yeah. That he says I, on the moonlight, the moonlight. I once saw the Messenger of Allah so on the night of a full moon. On that night yes, the this hadith is Daif. This hadith is daif, but it has in it what it has testified, like there are other companions who described him in the same way. Okay, he had slightly curly hair. Now again, it's mentioned that his hair was not curly so that it, it intertwined, but it was more of a wave. Like it was more of a, a natural sort of wave in the hair, as in the hair was not immaculately straight, it had a slight wave in it. He was of medium stature with broad shoulders. It said that he was his, he had a slim sort of a slim waist. This is mentioned in other hadith that he had a slim waist. And again, those of you who train, what is the ideal for a man? Is it not to have a slim waist and broad shoulders, right? So he had broad shoulders, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and yet his he, his shoulders were broader than the lower part of his body. It's also mentioned that his stomach was immaculately flat. Like he had no protruding part of his stomach, it did not protrude. Neither what did his back protrude. So it wasn't so, so much so, he had that kind of lean muscle, that it wasn't so much so that it stuck out, or that he had like a big sort of stick out stomach and stick out back and stick out shoulders, but he had broad shoulders. The upper part of his body was broad, and the lower part or the medium part of his body was not as broad. Uh, likewise, they said that his in another hadith that his stomach was flat and his back was flat, meaning that there was no sort of fat or no sort of excessive bulk that would show on him from the front or from the back. His hair was thick, 
reaching his earlobes. There are many, many, many narrations about his hair. From the narrations about his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that it would reach his earlobe. And some of the companions said it would reach his shoulders. And some of them said it would strike the tips, the tips of his hair would strike his shoulders. And it's also narrated that if he was able to gather his hair together in two braids at the front, he would do so. And when his hair was too short to gather together in two braids from the front, he would not do so. So a lot of things mentioned about his hair and we're not going to be able to cover all of them. But generally, the most common was that his hair would reach his earlobes or just past his earlobes. And there are three words for the length of your hair between your earlobes and your shoulders in Arabic. Three unique words. Al-Jumma. And Al-Jumma is the hair that comfortably reaches the shoulders. Jumma. The hair that comfortably reaches the shoulders. And then there is Al-Wafra. Wafra. And that is the hair that reaches Wafra. Just write in English. W-A-F-R-A-H. That would reach the, the shahma to udhunay. This is the shahma of your ear here. The, what do you call it? The earlobe. Where women put earrings and not men. <laughs> That's how the ulama describe it. Yani where women put, they would say shahma to udhun is where women put the earrings and not men. Shahma to udhunay. The earlobe. And when the hair reaches the earlobe, it's called al wafra. And the hair that reaches between the earlobe and the shoulder, I think is called a limma or a lemma. I think limma with a kasra, but we'll have to check it. And that is the hair that reaches between the earlobe and the shoulders. So they have very de detailed ways of describing. And in here, the word used is jumma. Jumma, which is the hair that reaches the shoulders. But then he makes it clear that this hair, even though it was as though it was reaching the shoulders, it only came up to the earlobes. But sometimes he would let it grow between the earlobes and the shoulders and sometimes he would, if it was a little longer, he would tie it in two braids as the men used to do. Not like the women's braids, like the women did, where they plait their hair, but braids that would come from the front of the hair, tied backwards and from the front. And this is how the men used to wear, especially in battle. The men didn't used to like their hair sort of like, you know, all over their face while they were trying to shoot somebody or, you know, cut someone's head off with a sword. They would tie their hair into into braids and some of you might have seen some pictures either from films or from you know from uh, uh, pictures of history and things of people who had this and we can't say that's exactly how the messenger of Allah used to have it but you see sort of braids coming down uh, two big braids coming down the front okay. uh, how is the style? Parting? the parting will come to inshallah if, if we don't come to it in one of the hadith we'll we'll, we'll talk about the parting of the hair um, <clears throat> okay his hair was thick so he had a good head of hair. It wasn't, you know, thin that it was balding. It wasn't that it was for remember, this is a 60 year old. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, 55, a 60 year old, subhanallah. And his hair is, it has a thick, you know, head of hair with no white in it at all. And he wore a red hulla. A hulla is a clothing or a, pair, a set of clothing that is made up from a rida and an and a, and a izhar. So it's made up of an izar, uh, like a, 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 a skirt or a, you know, a wrap around, like a wrap that you wrap around your, like what you guys call a lungi, yeah? Like, uh, like a wrapped, something that is wrapped around your waist. And it's made of a rida. And a rida is what you wrap. So in ihram, you have uh, your izar, which is the, your izar, which is the, the bottom part. And you have your rida, which is the top part. A hulla is something made up of those two parts. And the reason they say sometimes it's called a hulla is because one of them overlaps the other. That's apparently why they call it hulla, because part of it overlaps the other. Now, the problem here is not the hulla. What's the problem here? The color red. The color red. Because the Prophet ﷺ forbade us to wear red. So what do we say? Who's going to show, show me some fiqh? This hadith is sahih. He was wearing a red hulla and it's mentioned in the hadith of Jabir and it's mentioned in many hadith. Did have some parts of uh, a different color in it? Some parts of another color in it, mashallah, Allah. Some parts of another color, or it was not absolutely red. Maybe it, it, it didn't have that pure red color that was from top to bottom. And this pure red color, it seems like it is allowed for women to wear it 
and Allah knows best because of the hadith that the Prophet said, give it to one of, uh, or, or give it to your wife, or give it to one of your wives, I forget the narration now. But for men definitely, wearing completely red. And some of the ulama have other things, they say it depends what it's dyed with, is it dyed with saffron, or is it dyed with something that gives a red tint, but it's not purely red. In any case, it was not a pure red color from, you know, like, uh, sort of the red that you attract a bull with, yeah? from top to bottom, but it was of a reddish color, maybe mixed with another color. And I've never seen anything more beautiful than him, and we've seen that there are many, many other Sahaba who described him in this way, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa anhum ajma'in. Muhammad ibn Ismail narrated, oh before that, let's have a look at the Senate. In this Senate, there are some very, very, very important people. Muhammad ibn Bashar, is important because like Qutaybah who was in the first hadith, Muhammad ibn Bashar is someone who was a teacher of all of the six Imams of hadith. Al-Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Al-Tirmidhi and Nasai ibn Majah. All of them took hadith and recorded hadith from Muhammad ibn Bashar. And Muhammad ibn Bashar most of the time he narrates from Muhammad ibn Ja'far. And then we come to Shu'bah. Shu'bah is one of only two or three people to be described as Amirul Mu'mineen fil Hadith. He is the leader of the believers in Hadith. And from the most knowledgeable of the Muslims ever in history of Hadith. And Shu'ba was harsh. Shu'ba was extremely harsh. One of his students, it's narrated about Shu'ba, that one of his students one day was narrating a Hadith and uh, you know, he narrated this hadith and he, and he brought this hadith from so and so. And when Shu'ba heard him say it, he turned around to him and he just slapped him straight across the face. <laughs> and maybe on the head, maybe not on the face, but he just slapped him, you know, straight across. And he said, Is this how you narrate from the Messenger of Allah? And, the, and then the poor guy said, Yeah, that's what I heard. So then Shu'ba went off and he traveled, you know, to Baghdad and to here and to there to look for the hadith. Shu'ba was an extremely tough teacher. And he is one of those people who was extremely harsh in his criticism of narrators as well. So Shu'ba is an important person to know because Shu'ba was an, a very, very important figure in hadith. So it's important you know him. Um, likewise, Abu Ishaq without a shadow of a doubt. And Shu'ba is one of those people who it's said only narrated from someone who is reliable. So Shu'ba was not known for narrating from people who were weak. In fact, uh, Shu'ba has one of the most famous statements that I, would be, that I would commit zina is more beloved to me than that I would give a false impression in a chain of hadith to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu And Shu'ba is someone who was extremely, extremely uh, harsh and extremely strong in defending the sunnah and uh, defending the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who else has it been said about them, Amir al mumin fil hadith? Does anyone know? Sufyan al Thawri, who was there along with Shu'ba. Who else? One other person comes to mind. Only one that I that I can recall anyway. Uh, Al-Bukhari. Three people that are commonly known as Amir al Mu'minin for hadith. Shu'bah, Sufyan al Thawri, and Al Imam al Bukhari. So you see the kind of level of the person that we're talking about here. And uh, inshallah, we'll come across some other points. I just thought I'd pick that up. Muhammad ibn Ismail. Allahu alam, is this al Bukhari? Maybe. Muhammad ibn Ismail al Bukhari. But we'd have to check the, the chain about whether, that, whether this is a hadith he's narrating from al Bukhari. From Abu Nu'aym, from al Mas'udi, from Uthman ibn Muslim ibn Hurmuz, from Nafi' ibn Jubair ibn Mut'im, from Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu an. That he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was neither tall nor short. His hands and feet were heavy and thick. So his, now it's mentioned that his hands and feet were heavy, as in were dakhm, were thick. But at the same time, it's mentioned that his skin was so soft. Anas radiallahu an said, I have never touched silk as soft as the skin of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So Anas said, I've never touched silk as soft as the skin of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So his skin was ex so now if you normally think of heavy set hands, what do you think of? You think of rough, you know, like sort of big heavy like hands and really rough and sort of it wasn't like that. His hands were large because he was so powerful and strong. Allah gave him the strength of 
of many, many men. And it's been narration 10 men and it's narrated uh, more than that. So the point is that he was extremely strong and he had thick hands and feet, but his hands and feet were very smooth. So again, the beauty is there that when you touched it, it was finer than touching silk. It's also narrated about his feet that when he would make wudu, the water would not cling to his feet because of how smooth they were. The water would not be, not even a drop of water would cling to his feet. Like, you know, when you pour water over something, it's very, very smooth and the water just, just drops off. Would drop off his feet naturally because of how smooth his feet were. And that it, his feet had no coarseness or no, um, like, dips or, you know, uh, like, uh, not moles, but, you know, when you have, like, uh, like dips and, and sort of holes and like, you know, grain rough skin that it wasn't like that. It was smooth, amless, they said, like very, very, very smooth. And it's, it was as soft as skin, uh, as, as silk. Um, he had a very large, or he had a large head. It was not excessively large to the point that his head was considered to be like huge, but it was a large head. Again, this is a sign of strength and it's a sign of beauty and it's a sign of manliness. He had large bones. I mean, the meaning of large bones here is not large bones, but that his, uh, his, his physique was a, strong, was a strong physique and that he had a strong frame. It was not large that it made him like large in terms of, you know, big build, but it was, it was large in the sense that his bones were, you know, were, 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 were strong, were, were, were something that showed his strength. You could see in his physique his strength. So he had large bones, but it's not, again, excessively large. So the meaning of large bones here is not excessively large to the point that, you know, he, he has a long, long frame. His arms were neither excessively long, nor were they short, but they were of a medium length. But his, his bones that show, you know, the bones in the body that show your strength and your power were large. So it's mentioned that, you know, the chest bone and the back and, you know, sort of the, the bones that show and the physique that shows someone's strength. Was, was, was large, without being excessively so. And he had a long line of fine hair from his chest to his navel. It's mentioned that most of the body of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was hairless or had very little hair on. He had very, very little hair to the point that some, uh, some of them uh, describe parts of his body as being mujarrad, as being like having no hair at all or almost no hair at all. Where he was narrated as having hair is a fine, uh, fine hair that would come from the chest to the navel straight as though someone had drawn a line. So again, the, the hair was very, very fine. You could almost not see it, but it was almost like someone had drawn a line between his chest and his navel, some f very fine chest hair. And it's mentioned that most of the rest of his body was hairless or had very, very little hair. There was some hair around the khatam, around the, um, the seal of the Prophet on, on his back. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it was mentioned that most of his body was hairless or had very little hair. But he had this fine, very, very, very fine hair that ran from his chest to his navel. When he walked, he leant forward as if descending a slope. I have not seen anyone before him or after him who was comparable to him. And this is another example of the Sahaba emphasizing the beauty of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this hadith, this is the hadith of Ibrahim ibn Muhammad, one of the sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib, narrated to me that when Ali described the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was neither extremely tall nor extremely short, we've covered. He was of medium stature along the people, but Anas said he was closer to being tall than short. His hair was neither curly nor completely straight, rather in between. We've seen that in the other hadith. He did not have a very fleshy face, neither was it completely round. In another hadith it's mentioned, was the face of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like a sword? And some of them say like a sword means as in was it long and sort of sharp like a sword? And he said no, rather it was like the moon. Meaning it didn't have the sharpness of a sword, nor was it as long as a sword, but it was <coughs> round, but not so round that it would be considered to be completely round, but it had a roundness to it and a little length to it. So it was not uh, something, it was not a long face, but it was a round face without being completely 
round or extremely round. Rather, it was only slightly so. He was white-skinned, having a reddish tinge, which we've covered. His eyes were large with jet black, black, black pupils and his lashes were long. It's mentioned that his eyelashes were very long. And it's mentioned in another hadith, and we have to check the authenticity, but it's mentioned in another hadith, رَأَيْتُهُ أَكْحَلْ وَلَيْسَ بِأَكْحَلْ I saw him as though he was wearing kuhl. And kuhl looks like mascara. Yeah, like it makes your eyelashes look long and dark and black and it separates between the, between the eyelashes. رَأَيْتُهُ أَكْحَلْ وَلَيْسَ بِأَكْحَلْ I saw him as though he was wearing kuhl, even though he was not wearing kuhl. So his eyes would look, his eyelashes would look so dark and so long and separate that it is as if he had applied kuhl to his eyes. His point or his joints were as lo were large. Again, we mentioned that his physique was a point you could see his strength without being bulky, excessively bulky. As was his upper back. We mentioned that his broad shoulders, but his waist was not as wide as his shoulders. So he was he had a tapered waist. He did not have hair all over his body, but had a line of fine hair from his chest to his navel. When he walked, he would walk briskly as if descending a slope, we've covered. When he turned, he would turn his whole body. And this is from the humility of the Messenger of Allah The way of the kings would be that, you know, he would glance to his right or glance to his left, you know, sort of, who is behind me. When the Messenger of Allah heard a voice from behind, he would turn around completely his whole body and he would face the person that he was talking to. So this is a show of his humility sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Between his two shoulders was the seal of prophethood. He was the seal of the prophets and he had the most giving of hearts. He was the most truthful of people, the best of them in temperament and the most sociable amongst them. Whoever unexpectedly saw him would stand in awe of him uh, and whoever accompanied him and got to know him would love him. And the meaning of this is if you saw him for the first time, you would just be struck by his handsomeness, his beauty, his manners, his softness, his kindness. Everything would just strike you about him. And that's why it's, it's a sunnah for a Muslim to take care of his appearance, to, to, to present himself to the people in a good way. The first time they would see him, they would be in awe of him. They would just be struck that who am I looking at? This amazing person I'm looking at from his physique, from his looks, from his character, his manners. And then when they got to know him, they would come to love him. Those who describe him would say, I have never seen anyone before him or after him who was comparable to him. Inshallah, I think that's a good place for us to stop. And inshallah, we're going to continue adding to the hadith. One thing I don't think is mentioned in here, although it may be mentioned in here. Uh, we can have a look, inshallah. If it isn't, make a note about his teeth. His teeth were, had very slight gaps in between them in a way that was, in a way that is very uh, sort of handsome. You know, his teeth were not like crammed in together like they looked like they had been like sort of, you know, squashed in together. They had an even and, and small gaps between, not gaps that left like big gaps in his teeth, but they had the kind of gaps that, you know, when you have like dental surgery to get your teeth to look really good and they're all like straight and they have a nice, you know, so, and of course this is not permissible in Islam unless it's to correct, a, you know, like a medical problem or to correct, like a filing of the teeth is, is something that the Prophet ﷺ forbade. But his teeth were, very, you know, immaculately white and they were immaculately sort of shaped and equally spaced with very small uh, sort of gaps in between. We may come across this in one of the hadith. If we don't, then inshallah, this is something worth writing. What do you mean? He only said that we're not allowed to do something. Is that no, no, we're allowed to correct a, a, a natural sort of flaw that's happened, like one of your teeth, your embrace, there's nothing wrong with that. But what we're talking about is cosmetic surgery in order to correct the way that your teeth look. So you say, right, I don't like this tooth, it's a bit longer. I want them to file this tooth down so that all my teeth are exactly the same length. I want them to, you know, space them out so that they all, you know, basically what people get, you know, celebrities and actors and so on and so forth get done to their teeth cosmetically. This is changing the creation of Allah. But as for correcting something which is a, a problem, one of your teeth is growing into the other one, or, you know, you simply, the dentist wants to straighten your teeth out, or, you know, whitening your teeth 
uh, with natural sort of whiteness to, sort of, to get them back to the original color because you've been drinking too much coffee. All of these things are permissible, inshallah, and there's no problem with that. The what problem comes in cosmetic surgery to change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you for the purpose of looking good. Go wearing a gold tooth. A gold tooth, this is... Um, gold or uh, silver. Comes closer to, be, I'm, in my opinion, to being not allowed. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, if the doctor says it's necessary for a health reason and the Muslim doctors agree on that, then that's a different matter. Like they're worried about an infection yeah. and they think it has to be gold, you know, because they're very worried about a risk of infection. But inshallah, you know, now there are white teeth that are available um, that, you know, inshallah, false teeth that are white that don't have an infection risk. And so there's no real need. Gold was originally chosen because it was considered to be less likely to infect than silver. And that's why when people get earrings, they tend to put gold in because it's less likely to infect a person. But now, inshallah, if there's not an issue of that, unless there's a particular case where the doctor says, no, I, in my professional opinion, it should be gold because this is really a danger to you or it could cause you complications later on. And that's a different thing. And you have to ask each individual person has to ask for a fatwa. But the general principle is that the teeth should be white and not gold and silver. And some of the ulama mentioned this from the point of israf from wasting, you know, your money on expensive, you know, I mean, gold is to give to your wife or to spend, you know what I mean? It's not to put in your mouth. Taib, we come on to the hadith of Al-Hasan ibn Ali, the hadith of Hint. And I included this because it's just so comprehensive. It is so, so, so comprehensive. It is really, really massive. Now, inshallah, what we're going to do is go through it and try to mention which bits have an authentic basis and which don't because this hadith is da'if on jiddan and this hadith is da'if for two reasons there is uh, no sorry in this hadith there is jahala so there is uh, one of the narrators is unknown and there is a weakness in uh, this uh, in uh, Jubayr ibn Umayr. So this hadith is extremely weak. But the, we're going to see which bits um, are sort of, uh, we don't know who one of the sons of, uh, of uh, Abi Hala is, but we'll see, inshallah, this hadith. So, uh, Al Hassan ibn Ali, why did we say that Al Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu an would ask somebody to describe the Prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why did we say that Al-Hasan ibn Ali, we want hadith number six? Yeah. Why do we, these, these hadith are number number six, but they're not in order. The later numbers are in order. This might be hadith number 10 or 11 in the book, but in any case. Al-Hasan ibn Ali, radiallahu and why did we say that he would want someone to describe the Prophet sallallahu to him? He was very young. And even though he remembers his grandfather sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he he wants a more complete something that, as a man, he can, you know, he can really like hold on to. Yet yeah, that this is exactly in, in everything. He has a memory of him, but it's not the kind of memory that he can describe as every single feature. Or we say that it is. Uh, we say that he, it was because Hind was so good at describing people. He wanted something to memorize that. You know, some people you can meet a guy, and I, he can say to me. Muhammad described to me this brother, Abdullah. And I try to describe him, but I don't describe him very well. You know, I don't describe him in a way that's sort of uh, like you can, you can meet him. And someone you might have met him only once and you can describe him immaculately. This is how he looked and this is how... So let's have a look at this hadith. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was imposing, dignified, and one who is greatly honored and respected. Maybe this is a little bit more than what is mentioned in the Arabic. Uh, that he was a great person who was honored by his companions. He was a great person who was honored by his companions. And this is well known that he was honored by his companions. His face shone like that of the moon. Now in this we have to be careful. Some of the people who wrote about the Shama'il of the Prophet wasallam, <laughs> they said that the Prophet wasallam literally shone. They said that literally had nur that came out of his skin. And this is not true. 
The shining that is meant here is not the shining that means that he had a light, but that it was when you looked at him, his face seemed to be brighter than the other faces of the other people. Say, Muhammad Tim, haven't you broken your rule that everything that is said is taken literally? Firstly, this hadith is da'if in any case, but let's, uh, before that, let's look at the evidence. <coughs> One thing that's very important in the science of hadith is that you take all of the hadith together. Now let's look at the hadith of Aisha. And this hadith of Aisha is in one of the Sahihain, one of either Bukhari or Muslim or both, but I don't recall which one, but it's in, it's, it's in one of the two Sahih. And in this hadith, Aisha, she loses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at night. So she says, I began to look for him in the masjid. And she says, I began, the masjid's pitch black, I began to feel out the ground. So Aisha is taking her hand radiallahu anha, and she's feeling out for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then she says, until my hand gets upon his foot and I noticed he's in sajda. Now he's barefoot and Aisha puts her hand upon his foot. At no time does Aisha say, the masjid shone like a light and I saw him lit up like a Christmas tree in the corner of the masjid. SubhanAllah, <laughs> this is, the, there are hadith after hadith after hadith of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, at night and nobody mentioned that he had a light coming out of him. So this is something that we don't affirm for the Prophet وسلم, that he had a light that came out of his skin, but that his face was a face that had nadara on it. It had a brightness in it. And it had what we, you know, a nadara to wajh, a brightness in your face. How do you get a brightness in your face? Does anyone know a hadith about brightness in the face? Wudu, we have to check. That's perhaps on the day of judgment. Although Fajr, no doubt, but specifically a hadith. Specifically, that even these things are mostly in the akhirah. Not the night prayer. Relates to what we're doing now, inshallah. Not sitting in a gathering. Learning about. About what? Learning about the Prophet. Knowledge. Gaining knowledge. Okay. The hadith, Nadar Allahu Imra'an Sami'a May Allah brighten the face of the one who hears what I say and he memorizes it and he, and he returns it or relates it to the people as he memorized. He memorizes it, he keeps that memorization and he relates it to the people as he heard it. Farubba hamili fiqhin ghayru faqih. So perhaps the person who takes this fiqh or the person who takes this hadith might not understand everything that the hadith means and maybe he will give this hadith and relate it to someone who knows more about it than him. So if you want brightness in the face to learn the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to memorize them and to relate them as you heard. One of the narrations that people bring you know, to prove the light mm. and the Prophet we have to check the reliability of this narration that, that that is smile lit up the house because generally there are literally 10 20 30 hadith that in the sahihain in bukhari and muslim that clearly show that the light of the prophet وسلم, was a light that was a like a shine, like that his face was bright and that you looked at him and he had a brightness in his smile and a brightness in his face but it was not a light bulb it was not a, you know, it was not like and I'm serious, it was not a nur that shone out like a light, like the moon but it was something that had a brightness and they compared him to the moon not in the sense that he provides light for us when it's dark but in the sense that he was bright when you looked at him his face looked as though it was, you know, shining because of the brightness. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. He was somewhat taller than a person of medium stature, but shorter than a tall person. This is already sahih because we've seen this in other hadith. His head was large with slightly curly hair, and if the hair on his forehead parted of its own accord, he would keep it parted. Otherwise, his hair with its longest would reach the, reach the lobe of his ears. Again, this is authentically narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would part his hair at times when his hair was, you know, when he gathered it together, or he would part his hair at times, and, at and if his hair was excessively long, he would just let it go naturally. Uh, 
something. Used to have braids. I mentioned this in the beginning uh, of the talk that he used to have two braids <coughs> that would come down from the side of his uh, face. Salawatullahi wa sallam. Otherwise, when his hair at its longest would reach the lobe of his ears, it's also mentioned that it would reach the shoulders. So I think at its longest here, we have to take that again. There are some narrations that it would go longer. He was white-skinned. Again, that has to be taken in context. He was white-skinned with a reddish tint, or he was white with uh, a brownish tone to it. Um, again, uh, with a wide brow and thick curved eyebrows, which were, which were not joined in the middle. That's what it means. Whether that's what the translator translated, but that's what it means. That they were not uh, Qaran, and Qaran is where the, 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 uh, the, the, the eyebrows joined together in one. This is, this is called Qaran. And he was not Aqran. He was not like somebody whose eyes, but he had thick eyebrows. His eyebrows, I don't know the thickness of his eyebrows. Is it mentioned anywhere else? So we have to put a question mark next to that to check whether it's mentioned because this hadith is, as we <coughs> said, da'if. Between them was a vein that would throb when he was angry. He had a long aquiline nose. It's mentioned about his nose that it was somewhat long without being excessively long. So it was not like a really, really long nose, nor was it like a button or, or a small sort of like nose. It, was, it, had a it had a bit of length to it, but it wasn't excessively long. which shone with a light that would seem to elevate it. Either it shone or either he shone with a light. And again, we mentioned the light, which did, whoever did not carefully look at it would think that it was upturned. Again, I don't think this has a narration anywhere else. He had a thick, full beard that is mentioned elsewhere with firm cheeks that were not raised. I, his cheeks were not, his cheekbones were not like extremely high to the point that his cheeks were raised. He had a wide mouth with evenly spaced teeth and a fine line of hair extending from his chest to his navel. We've mentioned his wide mouth is mentioned elsewhere in the sunnah, so he had a <coughs> wide mouth. Um, again, this is a sign of usually strength and strength of voice and strength of, you know, someone has a very small and wide does not mean excessively wide. Again, it doesn't mean that his mouth was excessively wide, but that it was not very, very, very small. It was not like a very, very small mouth. It was a mouth that had a bit of wideness, uh, wideness to it. <coughs> his neck resembled that of an ivory statue, white in color, like smooth silver. He was of a goodly build, finely balanced. Again, some of that is, is mentioned, some of it isn't. His chest and stomach were level, meaning that he did not have a protruding stomach, and that is mentioned authentically. Um, and he had skin that would normally be, uh, his skin that would normally be covered with clothes had a luster about it. And this is what is meant by the light. His skin had a kind of a, a luster to it, like it didn't have any hair on it. And it almost, as if it almost shone, you know, like it, it's, a, but it's not, it's not a light, like a light switch, but it's a kind of a brightness in the skin. He had a line of hair extending from his upper chest to his navel, apart from that his chest and stomach were bare. The upper part of his chest, his forearms and shoulders had a lot of hair on them. This is not narrated anywhere else, but he had a long, he had long forearms with wide palms and heavy thick hands and feet. Again, we said his limbs were not excessively long, but he had long bones and we know that like he had po a powerful frame. <coughs> his fingers were long but not extremely so. He had high insteps. The instep is the place of your foot that doesn't touch the ground when you walk. And the meaning here again, the translator translated as high insteps, the meaning is not excessively so. So it would not be that his feet were completely arched when he would walk, but he had a tiny part of his feet that would not touch the ground when he walked, a tiny part of the instep inside of the foot, the part that doesn't touch the ground. Um, his feet were smooth and well proportioned because of which water would swiftly flow off them and vanish. When he walked, he walked briskly and with strength of purpose, but placed his feet on the ground softly. So, and we know this from the Quran, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَىٰ أَرْضِ هَوْنًا The slaves of Ar-Rahman who walk on the earth with a measured walk. You know, he wasn't someone who walked with pride. He wasn't someone who walked with a stomp. He walked softly, but when he lifted his legs, he lifted his legs with purpose and strength. When he turned to address someone, he turned his entire body. He would constantly lower his gaze, looking more to the ground than the sky. Most of the time, he would merely glance at something. This mention he would merely glance at something, 
uh, some of the ulama say that it means that he would not be so attached to the dunya that he would look at something with longing. Like he would look at a camel or a house and say, oh, look how beautiful that, like he didn't look at things with a longing. Like you might look at a nice car that goes past and like sort of follow it down. He didn't do that. And some of the things said that the majority of the time he looked, it was for the purpose of taking a lesson from something. So he would look at something, take it in and look away. He would not spend excessive time staring at things. Most of the time he would merely glance at something, he would have his companions walk in front of him. So he would not be like the king that walks in front of his people, but he would walk amidst his companions. Uh, and he would hurry to greet whoever met him with salam. And there's this, uh, most of this hadith is authentic, but there are certain parts that need to be, you know, sort of taken with a pinch of salt. In hadith number seven, Muhammad ibn Bashar narrates from Bishr ibn al waddah from Abu Aqil al dawraqi or Abu Aqil, sorry, not Aqil, Abu Aqil al dawraqi from Abu Nadra, who said that I asked Abu Sa'id al-Khudri about the seal of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said a protruding piece of flesh on his back. So now we come to the seal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the seal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the point of the science of hadith is what we call mushkil. Mushkil. As in mushkil al-athar. There are so many different narrations about the seal of the prophethood and almost every one is different from the other. However, what do we do as students of hadith when these narrations differ with each other? How do we deal with it? First thing we do is gather them all together. The second thing we do is that if we can join between them without rejecting them, so we got rid of the unauthentic ones that say it was black and green and purple and whatever other ones they have. We've got the rid of the ones that say that it was like the, the mark of cupping on his back because they're all daif. We're left with the authentic ones. Then what do we do? We try to join between them. So every companion, some of them stared at the seal, some of them just touched the seal from behind his clothing, some of them glanced at it, some of them saw it from the side, and so each one described what they saw. And most of the authentic narrations are quite similar, but you have to understand them in the light of each other. So if someone says it was hair, and the other one says it was skin, one of the things that what the person who said it was hair, he only touched it with his hand, he didn't see it. And the person with skin, who said skin, saw it directly. So how do we join between them? We say that it was skin, it was a piece of his flesh, it was a piece of, of, of flesh, of, of meat, of, you know, like, uh, of muscle or of, like, uh, of, um, you know, uh, skin and, and, and a piece of his body. But at the same time, we say that it was clearly had hair around it. Because when the companion felt it, it felt as though it was hair. It was very soft and it had hair around it. So we know that. We know, so we're going to try and join between these things. Uh, the easiest hadith is this hadith, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who says a protruding piece of flesh on his back. In hadith number eight uh, is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Sarjis radiallahu an, who says, I went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was amongst a group of his companions and I moved behind him like this. I, he went around the back. And when he went around the back of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ realized what he wanted him to do. You know, he saw everyone had heard about the seal. And you know, people, the Jews and the Christians especially, had heard about the seal. So when they went around the back, the Prophet ﷺ knew, and you know, in, out of his humility and his respect and his kindness towards people, he didn't say, you know, what are you staring at? What are you looking at? He just lowered his rida. So he was wearing a, a rida. He was wearing his wrapped around uh, sort of upper garment and he just lowered it to show him the seal. He said, I saw the seal between his shoulder blades resembling a clenched fist. Resembling a clenched fist. Either in size or either in its sort of protruding out. Surrounded by which were marks looking like moles or small moles. So I went to kiss it and said, May Allah forgive you, O Messenger of Allah. He replied, and you also. The people said, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seek forgiveness for you? He said, yes, and you also. And then he recited, and seek forgiveness for your sin and for the believers, male and female. One of the best, uh, we're going to come to the latter part here. But what is narrated about the seal? Let's just give a, an overview. Okay, it's narrated that it was on his back between his shoulder blades. 
but that it was closer to his left hand side than his right. So it was on his back between his shoulder blades, but it was closer or between his shoulders. Ketif, not maybe not the shoulder blade. I don't know what you call a ketif. We'll, we'll, we'll just do a quick search to get the right word. It might not be the shoulder blade, but between, between the, the, the shoulders, but closer to the left hand side than the right. Closer to the left hand side than to the right. And some of the ulama say in this, uh, the benefit or the mention of it being closer to the left hand side uh, than the right is because that was the position of the heart. I.e., if you ask a doctor, they can access your heart, obviously, through the chest, and the heart is also close from the left-hand side of the, the body, slightly to the left-hand side. It's not completely to the right-hand, so it's slightly to the left-hand side. But whether this is true or not, it, it doesn't matter. That's just <coughs> some of the scholars mentioning perhaps it was closer to his heart. In any case, what is mentioned about the seal is that it resembled the egg of a pigeon. It resembled the egg of a pigeon. Um, and this is the most n reliable narration about its size, that it resembled the egg of a pigeon. And that's the most reliable regarding the size. So about the size of a pigeon's egg, <coughs> it resembles a clenched fist. It is flesh, i.e. it is uh, protruding from his body. It's not... Uh, something which is stuck on the outside, it's not just a mark. It's surrounded by small sort of lumps that look almost like moles. As for its color, it was the color of his skin. And all of the narrations that mention it being black or other colors or green or whatever, all of these are weak. It was the color of his skin. And I don't know that there's anything, any other narrations in terms of its uh, authenticity uh, that mention anything else about the color. It was roughly the color of his skin. One of the companions in another hadith, he, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was wearing something not a rida, it was something like a qamis or something like that that was uh, tight. And so he put his hand down the back of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and felt it and he said it felt like a clump of hair. But it was not a clump of hair because we know it was from his flesh. So we think that it had hairs around it to the point that it felt soft. It's also mentioned that it would wobble or move sort of as the, something inside the body would, it sort of would have a little bit of movement to it. Not to the point where it would move around his back but that it had a bit of movement uh, to it when it was touched. As for you know, these other narrations about colour and things being written on it and other things, there's no uh, authentic narration that I know of to that regard. And if we find one, inshallah, we will we'll definitely mention it, inshallah. Um, so we know the size, about the size of a pigeon's egg. We know that uh, it resembled a clenched fist. We know that it had some hair around it and perhaps some hair covering it. We know that it had some moles around it and two sort of protruding lumps, which I don't think I mentioned in here, but in another narration, like two sort of protruding sort of lumps on either side and it's um, I've heard that it could say a Muhammad Allah. as I said I don't know any authentic narration that anything was written on the khatim but we can check it inshallah in case we might find we may well find I may you know I haven't covered every single narration there may be a narration that says what was written on it but from what I know all the ones that said it's written go wherever you will be successful Muhammad Rasulullah or whatever that you know that uh, all of them are not authentic that I've come across so far but there may be there may even be in Bukhari and Muslim we have to inshallah look for it but from what I have seen so far I couldn't find anything about anything being written on it um, we said that it was closer to the left side than the right the last issue is when did it appear the ulama disagreed over when it appeared. Was it from birth? <coughs> there are three main opinions. One that it was from birth. One that it was from prophethood. And one that it was from the time when Jibreel cut open the chest of the Prophet وسلم, and cleaned his heart. And this third one seems to be the closest to the evidence. That it appeared, the seal of the prophethood, appeared after his heart sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was clean or was cleaned uh, in the bowl of uh, Zamzam and it was placed back into his chest. So it seems that after this 
this is when the, uh, the, the mark uh, appeared, the seal of prophethood appeared, and Allah Azza wa knows best. The latter part of this hadith, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Sarjis, is very important for us in refuting those people who go to the grave of the Prophet wasallam to ask for forgiveness. And they say, they use the evidence, the ayah in which Allah says, and if only they would come to you and seek the forgiveness of Allah and the messenger seek forgiveness for them. So in, they use this ayah, if only they would come to you and seek forgiveness from Allah and ask you to seek forgiveness for them. How does this hadith refute the people who go to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu and ask for his or ask him to ask Allah to forgive them? Referring to when he's alive. How do we know this is referring to when he's alive? No, we know that much, but there's something really key in this hadith as a refutation to this concept. There was a problem with the Munafiqeen probably when they didn't listen to Prophet Yes, this ayah was revealed, but the, the point is, like they say, Al-Ibarah bi umum al la bi khusus al sabab So the point is the ayah, what the ayah was revealed about doesn't matter, <coughs> but the fact that the ayah, wording of the ayah is general. But how do we know this ayah is only during his lifetime? This hadith is one of the strongest evidences, but where is our...? That's no, no, there's no doubt that he was alive. But how do we refute the people who say that I still go now when he's dead? What is there in this hadith that says this is only for when he's alive? He'd be alive in this very because the seal was only there when... when uh, no, that's, that's, that's possible, but there's something in the hadith, in the wording of the hadith. Did the messenger seek forgiveness for Brilliant. Did the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seek forgiveness for you? So this is after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that this hadith has been narrated. And his people, if it was the case that everyone went when he was dead and asked his forgiveness, they would not have asked him, like, really happy, did he seek, did he do it, did he seek forgiveness for you? They would have said, why don't you just go to his grave and ask his forgiveness now? <laughs> This hadith contains within it that his people were excited about the fact that during his lifetime that this Sahabi Abdullah ibn Sarajis radiallahu an had achieved that, that blessing and that honor of having the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seek forgiveness. And when he says, yes and for you, how does, this is another proof. How does Abdullah ibn Sarajis say that the Messenger of Allah sought forgiveness for the people of Abdullah ibn Sarajis? By them going to the grave? No, by the general command of Allah and ask Allah to forgive the believers. So do we see here at the end, he says, yes, and you also. They ask him, how? How is it that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, sought forgiveness for us? They still believe he can't do it when he's dead. So they sat there saying, how is it? It's impossible that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought forgiveness for us because he's dead and he didn't know us. And he says, no. Because Allah says, seek forgiveness for the believers, men and women. Meaning that the Messenger of Allah said, Allahumma ghfir al mu'minin wal mu'minat wal muslim al muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat. So the Prophet ﷺ would make this dua. So Abdullah ibn Sarajis doesn't say, yes, for you also go to his grave or when you went to his grave. He says, yes, for you also when he made the general dua, O oh Allah, forgive the believers. The Muslims male and female and the believers male and female. There's something narrated about the virtue of saying Allahumma ghfir al-mu'minin wa mu'minat. What's the, what's the virtue of this hadith? This hadith is ajeeb. You know this hadith when I heard it, it actually, I heard it just yesterday and it actually, you know, some, so it actually made me just stop. And that is, whoever says, oh Allah, Forgive the, belie the Muslims, male and female, and the believers, male and female, the, li the living from them and the dead, gets one reward for every single believer that has ever existed. So you're talking about a lot of hasanat. Billions, Allahu Alam, yani how many hasanat that you get by saying, Oh Allah, forgive 
the Muslims, male and female, and the believers, male and female, the living from them and the dead. Or however you say, oh Allah, forgive the believers, male and female. And like the dua you make in Janazah, you know, Allahumma ghfir li hayyina wa mayyitina wa shahidina wa ghaibina and, and so on and so forth. So the, when you make this dua and you ask Allah to forgive the all of the believers, you get a reward for every single believer that that covers. And if you say al-ahya'i minhum wal amwat, that reward doesn't just cover those who are alive, but it covers those who have died as well. So every single person you make dua for, you get a reward for. And you just made dua for every believer living and dead from the male and female, and every Muslim living and dead from the male and the female. That's a lot of people you're going to get a reward for. So this is a dua that people should say frequently in order to increase their hasanat. And this hadith, as I said, has two places where it refutes this concept. The first is the people asking, did, did he really make, seek forgiveness for you? Which they wouldn't have thought was a problem if they could go to the grave and get it themselves. And the second, and this is even clearer, when he explains how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, asked for forgiveness for them, he didn't say that when you visited the grave, he, made forgive, he asked Allah forgiveness, or when so-and-so, he said, that by his dua, O oh Allah, forgive the believers, men and women, and the Muslims, men and women, those who are alive from them and those who are dead. That's how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, sought forgiveness for you and for me and for everybody. Jayid. That takes us to the end of what we want to talk about, the physical characteristics uh, for the time being. Of course, we have missed physical characteristics, no doubt. There are things that you know, we won't be able to cover in that time. But inshallah, that's a good start for his physical, the, the basic physique. We know that his, uh, how, his build, we know his height, we know his skin complexion, we know what his face looked like. It was rounded, but not extremely round. We know uh, how his hair looked like. We know that his beard was thick and long. We know um, about how his feet were, how his hands were, his bones and his physique and his structure. We know about how his stomach was and how his chest was and the chest hair. We know about the seal of the Prophet uh, Hood. Uh, that he had on his back sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is something that we've got a lot of knowledge about his physical appearance now